I want to take sort of a, um, everything that we've learned from the videos, what is a spirit and what is the human spirit, because this is our life, and I want to try to apply it. Um, I also want to keep the video fairly short, because sometimes I have a tendency to go on and on, and so... Um, Let's consider some things um, about the, the process that we've seen that the human spirit is in, going from darkness to light, from um, the power of Satan to the power of God, uh, and recognize what it is that God is calling us to do in this process. Um, first of all, I want to think about the, what we've learned about the triune nature of man, body, soul, spirit. So, you live your entire life up until the point whenever you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You live your entire life where you're... Let's just read this. Um, the cross is foolishness to you, 1 Corinthians 1.18. Uh, spiritual things are foolishness, 1 Corinthians 2.14. Your mind and conscience are defiled, Titus 1.15. You're puffed up in your fleshly mind, Colossians 2.18. The carnal mind is enmity against God, Romans 8.7. The carnal mind is death, Romans 8.6. Your mind is set on the things of the flesh, Romans 8.5. Your mind is blinded by the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Your understanding is darkened, Ephesians 4.18. Your thoughts are futile, Romans 1.21. Your thoughts are evil, Matthew 15.19, Mark 7.21. You're evil-minded, Romans 1.29. You're double-minded, James 1.8. You're fearful, 2 Timothy 1.7. Your enemies in your mind with God, Colossians 1.21. Your uh, intent and thought is evil, Genesis 6.5. Um, your mind is debased, Romans 1.28. You're led by the desires of the flesh and of the mind, Ephesians 2.3, and your mind is set on the things of the earth, Colossians 3.2. I don't think that that's an exhaustive example, but it's just, the point is, is that your, your spirit is darkened. It is not oriented towards God. And what did we learn about the relationship between the soul and the spirit? The spirit is kind of like a, a river, and the soul is kind of like a lake. The river is feeding into the lake, and obviously the lake is the fruit of everything that's been fed into it. I don't know if you've ever heard the, the saying, the mind is the gateway to the soul, but the mind feeds into the soul, and eventually the soul reflects what's being fed into it. You are what you eat, right? So a mind that is uh, meets the criteria of all the things that I've just mentioned feeds into your soul, and um, your soul is defiled. It's it's disgusting. Your memories and your attitudes about things are ungodly. And that's not to say that there's no grace in your life because God gives a common grace to all people. And so there are some people that, that are unsaved that are have, you know, great gifts or are very nice or very generous or so on and so forth. Um, but that's only because of the grace that God gives. But then we um God grants repentance. We repent. Um, you'll recall repentance um, in, in the Greek, the word is metanoia, which means a change in your mind. Um, you receive the Holy Spirit. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, and you can, you can read into this, um, into the sections in the book, but the, the Holy Spirit is this down payment of salvation, and he's a seal of, of salvation. Um, he is the presence and the power of God. He enables us to worship God. He enables us to pray to God. He enables us to follow Christ on the earth. And so all of a sudden, in, in our, our mind goes from this to BAM! We have this, this, this power that is in us. And sometimes God... Uh, Sometimes God does this thing where he, ta he takes away things, whether it be addictions or mindsets, just immediately, and it's just gone. And you didn't have to work at it. You didn't even pray for it or ask for it. It's just, he just, whoop, plucks it out, and it's gone. Um, but then there's other things that we end up struggling with 
our entire lives, things that are difficult and costly and burdensome, take up your cross and follow me, right? Um, deny yourself daily, take up your cross and follow me, right? Um, and so we, now that we have this Holy Spirit as part of our being, um, he is in us. We do not become the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not become us, but he's there and he's engaging in a war. And we see this in, in Romans chapter seven. And we also see this in Galatians chapter five. The Holy Spirit is engaged in a war on the, the old things, all of this stuff that I just mentioned, um, with respect to the spirit and the soul, so we are called to renew our mind. Remember, our mind is our, part of our spirit. And um, God gives a promise in Psalm 23 that he is the restorer of our soul. And so he desires to heal and cleanse those the guck, all the guck that's piled up in our soul for our entire lives. And again, that's a process. It, does, it doesn't remotely happen in the blink of an eye. And uh, could God have done it in the blink of an eye? Of course he could have, but it pleased him not to do it. Um, it. It pleased him to, for us to be in the fight and in the struggle. And so what is this? Um, well, f- first of all, let me, t- let me talk about, I st- talked about where we started. Now let me say something about where um, we're going to end up. And by talking about where we're going to end up, we can have some sense of how we're going to get there. Okay. So the end, um, second Peter, uh, one, five through seven, he gives a list of these things, which kind of build on each other, faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness. And ultimately the very highest standard is love. Love is kind of like a four-letter word nowadays. People have love on their t-shirts and people have signs in their living room that say live, laugh, love. And it's just like, do you do you know that love is the highest standard? And that you probably have never actually done it, though you have it, you know, cheaply plastered various places. Like love is the highest standard, is the costliest thing. The the notion that you have loved, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Well, let me tell you something. I mean, if, if you haven't read the Bible cover to cover, how can you remotely claim to love the, have loved the Lord your God with all your mind? You haven't read his book. I mean, so, you know, come on. Let's just be a little honest here. The, every, time, every time you see a homeless person, what would you want them to do for you? Love your neighbors yourself. What would you want them to do for you in that moment? Right? House, car, bath, clothes, a place to rest because I've been spending so much of my time just trying to survive. Um, a massage. I'd like to take a European vacation. Like, what would you? What would you want in their situation? And then, of course, ask yourself the question: Did you do any of that? Did you give them a dollar? Like, come on, you're gonna really claim that you've met the very highest standard, right? Of laying down your life for your brother. Like, you gonna claim that? Like, I, I'm not gonna claim that. I'm not remotely going to claim that. I confess to God all the time. I've never loved one person. I mean, so let's just please be honest and admit, like, we don't. We don't love people. We like to pretend. But let's just be honest. We don't love people. Okay, so we got a work to do. That's that's the point. My point is not to condemn. My point is just to say we got work to do. Um, Ephesians 1, 18 through 19, know the hope of his calling. Uh, The knowledge of the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The exceeding greatness of his power towards those believe, right? We're going to know all those things. Um, we're going to comprehend the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you might fill, be filled with the fullness of God. Mindful of the things of God. We're going to set our sights on heaven. We're going to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that we are going to be worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Uh, The ending point is we're going to be clothed with Christ. 
We're going to be changed into the image of Christ because that's from glory to glory. That's where we're going is we're becoming more. We're supposed to be becoming more and more like Jesus every day. The mind of Christ. We're going to be in the kingdom of God. We're going to be in the kingdom of light. We're going to worship God and serve God. We're going to have the heart of flesh and understanding. We're going to have the new spirit that Ezekiel promises in chapter 36. Um, we're going to know everything completely, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. We're going to measure up to the full and complete standard of Christ. And so for, for somebody who claims that you don't have a sin nature, like, really? You, you going to say that you measure up to the full and complete standard of Christ? Wow, that is pretty heavy duty um, statement. You are perfect in Christ Jesus. Um, I think it's Colossians one twenty eight. My writing's a little scrunched there. Like re- like that. Like we're on the way there. This life is a journey. The notion that we're just immediately we're just perfect, and we just don't have a sin nature anymore. We just don't sin anymore, and we're just ro- floating on a cloud. Like that's definitely not my experience. That is definitely not my experience. We are on the way there. And so, um, what is what is the process look like? And so, I just want to outline. Some, things, some notes that I have written here. I don't have any of this typed up. It's just kind of in my notebook. Hopefully at some point I can, God has never allowed me to work on a book on the, the, uh, the model of transformation of the mind. And so here's the point. We started out kingdom of Satan, power of darkness, Satan in our hearts, enemies with God, slaves to sin, darkened mind, on and on. I read all those things. We're ending up being clothed with Christ and measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ, Ephesians 4.13. So how do, we, how do we get from A to B, right? And it's a process, right? The start of the process is that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That is salvation. We are guaranteed salvation. You cannot lose the Holy Spirit. You cannot be unsealed with the Holy Spirit. If, if you can imagine that you engage in some kind of a sin and you're, or because you sin, you're unsealed with the Holy Spirit, well, then nobody's going to be saved. Everybody's going to hellfire because everybody's a sinner, right? And so if you can lose your salvation, then let's just cut it to the quick. Everybody's going to the deepest hellfire because we're all sinners. If we are saved by grace, we are saved by what Christ did and not by what we did. And if we suppose that we're going to do something for God, then we don't, we don't, Jesus, we don't understand the salvation. We don't understand how wicked and darkened we were. And we don't understand how righteous and perfect he is. If we're going to claim that we're going to somehow meet the standard of God. So you know, understand what God's standard is. Just very simply, two points. Perfection. So, so for all eternity, he has communed with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the, as the Trinity. And he's always had perfection. Never, never had one flaw. Never had one sin. Never had one blasphemy. Never had one law, lie. He's been perfect, 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 perfect forever. So that's his standard is perfection. And number two, not just perfect in one moment, but perfect forever. So um, never ending perfection. So that's the, that's the two standards. Perfection that doesn't ever end, right? Have you, have you ever been perfect once? Like just once, just, just for a second. Just, oh, 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 I got there. Oh, darn, I'm not there anymore. Like, is that, is that it? His, his demand is, is as a holy God and he's infinite and eternal. His standard is perfection on top of perfection on top of perfection and it never, ever, ever ends. And so if you believe honestly that you can meet that standard, then I, I guess I don't have anything to say to you. And, I'm, and I don't know what you're going to do on YouTube, <laughs> frankly. Jesus, you should, you should uh, start your own YouTube or whatever. But um, completely lost my train of thought right there. Um, I am definitely not there. And uh, I am not remotely perfect. And so like the, the idea that you have to be perfect every second of every moment, every hour, every day, for all eternity... And you're going to meet that standard is, is kind of a pretty darkened, foolish, arrogant thing to say. Um, 
right? Because if you can't meet that standard, then you're going to lose, if you, and you can lose your salvation, you're going to lose your salvation because you're going to fail the standard of God. You're going to miss the mark. You're going to defile his holiness creation and he has to utterly cast you out and cast you down, right? And so the, the way that all of this is possible is because we're in Christ because of him, because of who he is, because of what he did, not because of us. Because if it's because of us, then we're going to hellfire. Let's just be honest. We're going to the lowest pit of hellfire and we're going to burn. Okay? So w- the reason why we're sealed with the Holy Spirit is because of him and what he did, not because of us. Not remotely, remotely because of us. We conjure up some kind of faith or some such thing. Okay, so how do we, how do we get how do we get there? And again, it is utterly God supplying the grace. There's no work or striving or strength that we have to supply. The thing that we supply is sinfulness, right? So um, we are on the process of sanctification. We are on the process of renewing our mind. We are going from faith to faith and glory to glory. Um, we're not giving place to the devil, so we're recognizing what, what those possible places are. We're putting off the old man and putting on Christ, which is a continual action. We're being filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice that there's never a void. Um, we put off the old man. We get rid of our old sin. We walk away from old sins, but then we fill it up with the things of God. And we're not just like we, we just chop off an arm and then there's just nothing there and it's just a void. That's not what it is. We replace what is taken or what we leave or change with something else, which is the things of God, right? We're filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a continual activity which we we seek after. Um, we're exhorted to put off malice and anger and put on tenderness and mercy. There's several several scriptures that I, that I've read. Um, we ask God to search us, Allah, Psalm 139. We ask him for help. Um, God uses all the circumstances of our lives, including our suffering and our hardship and our difficulty, to reveal sins, to sanctify us, to train us and prepare us. Uh, just some further thoughts. Um we're told uh, by Paul in Philippians 4 to meditate on these, what is true, what is noble, what is just, what is pure, what is lovely, what is of good report, what is virtue, what is praise. Are we set, We're setting our minds on these things. James tells us godly wisdom, chapter 3, 17 through 18. It's pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, without partiality and without hypocrisy. We're told... Galatians 5, 22 through 23, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so the, the, the point of these things is as we are, we're able, all of um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're, we're able to start discerning spiritual things and growing and moving from drinking milk as an immature believer to eating meat, as a mature believer, we are becoming mature. We are becoming sanctified. Um, Honestly, praying the prayer, God sanctify me, which is the will of God, we're told, that is, and becoming like Jesus, right? That is the the most dangerous prayer and that is the hardest prayer because we are praying that, that God will kill off the old man, the old way of thinking, the, the corruption that's in our soul that needs to be restored, the darkness that's in our spirit that needs to be made new. And that hurts. I mean, it's like if someone comes up and chops your arm off, like that's like, that is, does not feel good. Oh, I've got another one, you know, like it hurts. It doesn't feel good. But we understand that while Satan's way is, you know, hey, you can do this and it'll feel really good right now. And of course, he doesn't tell you about the eternal death that follows. God's way a lot of times is suffering and hardship and difficulty and sacrifice and persecution and tribulation and trial. But those things end in a fruit of righteousness which lasts forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, right? And so the devil, we get pleasure now and horror and death forever. Of course, he doesn't tell you, doesn't tell you that. He doesn't read the fine print. Right, But with God, a lot of times we suffer now and we struggle now, but 
in the end, we are better and stronger and more pure and more uh, reflecting the image of Christ without end, right? And so ultimately, God's way, even though it's difficult and costly, God's way is is far, far superior. And these are just some thoughts and reflections on what it means to renew the mind in the process of becoming a new creation.